What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons' Final Whistle podcast. We are coming to you from AT&T Stadium after the Falcons lost a lopsided one. I think everyone knows that. 43-3 to to the Dallas Cowboys. This was not a good result, not one that the Falcons were looking for to continue the positive momentum after beating the Saints in New Orleans. That didn't happen. This is a setback that they're going to have to rebound from very quickly as they move on to a Thursday night game against the New England Patriots. Tori McElhinney, your biggest takeaway from this specific game? I mean, it's hard to take one thing away from a game where the Falcons lost 43-3. to Right. Um, I think for me, it was just kind of the... I wanted this to be a competitive game. I really, really did, and I thought that after the they beat the Saints last weekend that it would have been, and so kind of coming out and seeing what happened in that second quarter was really discouraging, and it was really tough to watch, I think, down through the last two quarters of the game specific, specifically. Um, so I guess just my biggest takeaway is – that wasn't a fun one to watch. Yeah, it definitely wasn't. And that voice you heard was Tori McElhaney. I'm Scott Bear. I didn't do the intros off the top. Silly me. I think you mentioned my name. I'm, I mentioned yours, but nobody else's. No. So now yeah. we're going to backtrack <laughs> a little bit. I'm Scott Bear. <laughs> and Chris Rim coming up next. Uh, what are your thoughts after this uh, result that was disappointing for the Falcons and their fans? Uh, I think, like Tori said, it's hard to take away one thing, but maybe just the nature of the NFL. You know, the, the Cowboys were – Last week, we're down 30 to nothing in the fourth quarter with six minutes to go. And this week, they beat a team 43 to three. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just my biggest takeaway is, is just the nature of the NFL, how things can change so quickly. Yeah, and, and we're going to break this game down and identify things that went wrong in what Arthur Smith called the second quarter avalanche. We're going to go over some stats that really tell the story, and we're going to look forward to how the Falcons have to rebound quickly heading into that Thursday night game against New England at Mercedes-Benz Stadium where they haven't won a regular season, a, a game yet uh, this season. And then we're going to try to look forward and see how the Falcons can, as, as, as Foyer put it, stay in the hunt. They're in the hunt now. They want to play meaningful games in December, how they can do those things. But be, before we get to all that, a big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all-new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, like the Falcons Final Whistle podcast. Learn about all the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. We're starting off the first of four quarters, spending five minutes talking about where this Falcons-Cowboys game went wrong for the Dirty Birds, and it went wrong in the first half. Things kind of got out of control. Uh, Chris Ram, you, you wrote about this uh, for AtlantaFalcons.com. Where do you think this uh, this game got out of hand? Yeah, well, I think the, the second quarter, like like Arthur Smith mentioned, was kind of like the obvious point where, where things got out of hand. But I, I thought that the momentum really changed after that fourth down. Like it seemed like after they went for it on that fourth down, things just went negative after that after that point. But most importantly, I thought the obviously being up, um, you know, twenty eight to three is significant. But then to have a punt blocked, yeah, and then for them to score off the blocked punt, and then to go for a two point conversion when they're up, uh, what was it? They're, they're up. It was thirty. It was thirty-four to three when they were going for two, and it got it to thirty-six to three. Yeah. So that at that point for me is is when I thought that it it just kills it just kills you internally. I think it, as a as a player, as a as even as a if you're a fan watching the game, I, I think that that two point conversion for me watching that, I was just like, oh man, this is comebacks have happened. Big comebacks have happened before, but that seemed to me like just like a nail in the coffin. Yeah. I feel like it was a gut punch. Like it was one of those things that, you, you know, it wasn't that they put this huge gigantic drive together to go down and score. It was one play and immediately it goes from being a 28 to three lead to now 36 to three, which is, right. it, it feel it feels different. I think for me though, the, the moment that really um, kind of, took this game to a different level in, in that second quarter because that was, you know, Arthur Smith was right. It was that second quarter that really did it to him. Um, it, 
Atlanta – so Dallas had just scored – it, is, it was just the start of the second quarter. Dallas scored, and it was 14-3. to three. Atlanta goes out, has a three and out, and then Dallas goes out and in one, two, three, four, five plays has a touchdown. And it, it was a touchdown where it was on the back of uh, Dak Prescott giving it to, to – I can't remember who it was, but it was a 23-yard um, play on fourth and three. Like that, that that fourth down conversion in the second quarter, and then a play later, Ezekiel Elliott runs in in for from two yards out, and it's a touchdown to make it twenty one to three. That was, I think, the moment for me that it, it really kind of was like, okay, this is this is not going to be good. Here's the weird part, and I know we're talking about the second quarter avalanche, as Arthur Smith put it, um, but in the first quarter, the Falcons are taking yards in chunks, mm-hmm. like. M- uh, through their first two series, towards the end of their first two series, I looked at the team stats, and they were averaging like 14 yards a play. Yeah, I mean— They were moving the ball downfield. They were running well. They were space for everybody to move. It didn't seem like Kyle Pitts was ever going to not be open. <laughs> I know. I was about to say, Matt yeah. Ryan hit Kyle Pitts with ease multiple times. Right, and and uh, I think avalanche, the word that Arthur Smith used, I'm going to keep harping on, on that part because I, I think it's, it's, it's apt here. Yeah. Because it's not like the Falcons— were knocked down or weren't ready to play or came out flat or any of those types of things, that they were moving the ball early. And I don't dismiss the fourth quarter go for it at all. I I, I oh, thought yeah. that was a sign from Arthur Smith that, hey, man, field goals are not going to win this game. And guess what? He wasn't wrong because the <laughs> Cowboys put up 43. Right. So you were going to need to generate steady offense. And I think the steady offense was there, and it's one of those things where maybe momentum from week to week doesn't happen, but momentum in a game, as as uh, Deron Harmon said, that's real. Yeah. And the momentum definitely slipped to a point that I think the Falcons kind of lost control of what they were doing, and then by the time they got their hands on the joystick, it, you know, it it all kind of wasn't there for them in the same way. I mean, like we're talking about going to thirty six to three or what have you in the first half. Yeah. And there were points in the second quarter, and I'm filibustering here. There, there, there were points in the second quarter where I kept thinking. If they can do this thing right and then get some chunk plays mm-hmm. and score, then I kept creating situations in my mind so they could stem the tide because I just didn't believe it was going to continue to go down this way. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, it did. And things, I think, for the first time since since week one really kind of got out of control. So that's going to wrap up quarter number one with me talking for about 90 consecutive <laughs> seconds. Sorry about okay. that, y'all. Uh, but uh, we're going to move on here uh, and go over some go over some numbers that explain what happened and, and numbers that maybe were uncharacteristic of, of how the Falcons have been playing in recent weeks. We're starting quarter number two, diving into the box score, which I think sometimes stats can be deceiving. As, Tori, as you wrote in your uh, article for AtlantaFalcons.com, sometimes they can really identify where areas went wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that this is the 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 latter case here yeah. uh, as you broke it down. Yeah, it, it's funny because, what was it, three weeks ago I wrote a story on A.J. Terrell and Grady Jarrett, and I ex- like in the lead of that story I was talking about how stats don't matter for them because of the way that they're playing and they're doing things that don't show up in a stat book. And so, you know, you can't always, like, take stats for what they are and blah, blah, blah. But then there's always another side to the coin, and the other side to the coin was this game where it was a game where – the statistics, if you really look at the box score, if you look at the statistical breakdown of this game and how lopsided it was, it does paint a full picture of why this score was 43-3. to and, and I think for me, I really just broke it down. I mean, if you look at it, Dallas had 22 first downs, Atlanta had 11. Dallas had 431 total yards, Atlanta had 214. And then you get into the third downs. Atlanta was 1 for 11 in third downs. Dallas was 3-for-3 three three on fourth downs. Atlanta was 0-for-2. I mean, at Dallas was perfect in the red zone. The Falcons only got down to the red zone one time in their very first drive. I mean, these are all <laughs> like these are all things that when you look at this stat book, it's like, well, that's there's there's your reason. There's your reason for why the game was 43-3. to three. There's your reason for why the Falcons are leaving Dallas feeling not so great about what just kind of transpired here. I, I think <laughs> it's really funny because I'm usually not a big, like, look at the stats, and the stats tell the whole story. But for this game particularly, it absolutely did. Chris, did it ever 
surprise you to see how the third and fourth down situations played out. The, the Falcons have been pretty good in those situations, and they had some opportunities early in this game to, to get the Cowboys off the field and kind of weren't able to do it, and that's really where things you know, uh, kind of went nuts. Like, we actually talked about that, the, the fourth down that didn't work out for the Falcons. Well, the Cowboys, I think, on the very next drive had a fourth down yeah. that they converted. How big were those moments in your eyes? Yeah, well, I think the moment you just mentioned was huge because the, the Falcons didn't get a fourth down, and then the next series, the the Cowboys went and did exactly what, what the Falcons wanted to do. Another thing that just kills momentum, but I think the most surprising thing about the Falcons struggling on late downs was – the way they started the game, because they started the game, like you said, getting chunks of yards. Kyle Pitts was open every single play. Cordero Patterson was running, getting chunks of yards. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. Like it just, everything just stopped. Like the avalanche thing was, yeah. there was, it was just an avalanche. So, and, and that's what I was going to say too. One thing that stood out to me was Cordero Patterson. Um, he got his lowest targets of the season, his lowest carries of the season. And he um, he had an ankle, he had an ankle, he got his ankle taped up and then he just kind of never got back into the game. We saw like a lot of Wayne Gallman and maybe, maybe that was to, you know, protect him for Thursday, maybe, but usually when the Falcons play well, CP plays well as he has done every game, but yeah, yeah. he only had two targets and, uh, you know, four carries. So that, that was one. Yeah. Messed it out. Right. I, and I know that Arthur Smith talked about it after the game and he was talking about how like the reason you saw Josh Rosen and Wayne Gallman and, and all those guys was because, you know, they got to a point and they're looking at it in kind of probably the third, fourth quarter where they're like, we don't have any more possessions. Like we, we don't have the possessions to get this thing where we want it. And I think like that's I, granted, we didn't see CP like hardly at all after halftime, if at all after halftime. So maybe like, I think there's some something to be asked about like that this coming week. And um, but going back to kind of what you're talking about with the third down. Yeah, that's super efficiency. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, something else that's really interesting and kind of another caveat to this is that if you look at the Falcons like three and outs, they mm -hmm. all started with a no gain on – their first down play or a loss of yards, whether it was a sack or a tackle for a loss. So when you're going out there and you're not converting significant yardage or not even significant yardage, but a, a small chunk of yards on first or second down, that really makes it hard on yourself, on your offense to go third and long over and over and over again. And it was something that they, the Falcons couldn't do today. I mean, that's evident in they had four three and outs in a row between the second and third quarter. I mean, that, that kind of tells the story. Yeah, I, I think it absolutely does. Just one thing uh, real quick uh, that I wanted to highlight from the defensive box score. The Cowboys had 10 passes defensed, 10. Mm. Matt Ryan threw 21 passes. He completed nine. That's <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. that's a lot. That, that's Cowboys defensive backs or defensive linemen getting their hands on the football before the Falcons have a chance to catch it. That's not enough separation. That's not good enough for an offense that relies upon moving the ball through the air. Yep. If defenders are getting the hand on, on the ball, if they're close enough to make plays like that, uh, that often spells trouble. In quarter number three, we're going to start taking our eyes forward away from this game and what and towards the future and, and about what needs to happen for the Atlanta Falcons and their players to improve execution, to come out on the winning end of some of these games and stay relevant as we move forward. So when when you look at this uh, roster, Chris, and you looked at this game, is, is there an area, is there a group of players, is there a specific player that, that you think needs to step up to, to help the Falcons get and stay on that winning track? Yeah, I would, I would say the, the, the secondary for sure. Definitely, I think needs to step up today. We saw C.D. Lamb uh, get multiple touchdowns, and uh, Michael Gallup returned, and he played well. E even Amari Cooper, and I think it was kind of surprising because when you look at the when the Falcons played the Buccaneers, I didn't think I, I don't have the stats in front of me. But I don't think the wide receivers were getting open with as ease as as they were in this game, and I think that's kind of comparable wide receiving course. Mm -hmm. So maybe. I don't know if that's if that's you know there was someone today who was maybe in a position they weren't comfortable in or figuring that out. But I think moving forward, 
the secondary has to find out where guys feel comfortable at to ensure that, you know, you don't let a team throw for, I think, 317 passing yards and, you know, multiple guys have, you know, six receptions and, and multiple touchdowns. So I think I think the secondary um, definitely needs to step up. Yeah, and I think – I guess I'll stay with the defensive side of the ball for, for the group that I feel like needs to step up. I mean, I just constantly kind of think about pass rush – and the fact that Dak – it really did feel like Dak Prescott could kind of just do what he wanted to today. And, and I thought, you know, there was very little pressure on him outside of maybe a couple times. And then the, the thing that I thought really stood out to me is, like, even when the Falcons did bring pressure, they were bringing guys – they're, they're bringing DBs. And then mm-hmm. Dak was immediately picking that up and, and giving it to a C.D. Lamb or or even giving it to Ezekiel Elliott kind of just like running out. I mean, it's that kind of thing. So if it's like the only way that you can generate pressure is to send your DBs, like that that's going to hurt you, I think, in the long run because <laughs> you got to have those guys to kind of sure up the secondary. I, I don't know. It's just kind of really, really difficult to – face a quarterback like Dak Prescott and not put any pressure on him because he just, like I said, he just goes and does kind of what he wants to go and do. And, you know, Matt Ryan threw two interceptions and he was sacked a couple of times and Dak Prescott threw, for every interception that that Matt Ryan threw, Dak Prescott threw a touchdown and he wasn't sacked and he, and he's had a really really great day. I mean, I, I think his passer rating was was pretty pretty solid today. So that it's it, it for me it has to be pass rush because I think in order for this defense to for for all levels of the defense to to be playing the way that they want to gotta get after the quarterback and gotta at least make it hard on him yeah I, coming into this uh, segment I was thinking offensive line because we know Matt Ryan does better when he has time to carve a defense up he's pretty good at that but I'm staring at this box score right and I just see a wide receiver core that wasn't very productive and didn't create enough separation today. The best part about when the Falcons offense is really humming, sure, Kyle and and Patterson, they're going to get theirs. They're going to be the featured players in an offense, but they're never the only players in an offense. The ball gets spread around quite a bit, and we see production, as we saw in that Saints game, from a number of different people. Even if the catch and yardage totals aren't high, Tajay Sharp or OZ makes Mm -hmm. these types of big catches. I'm looking here, and outside of Kyle Pitts, there isn't there isn't a pass catcher that has more than 22 yards. Yeah. And and that's in a lot of targets. OZ was targeted seven times, and it's just one of those things where um, this is another game where Russell Gage has no catches, right? And I thought they were so – that they benefited – they benefited a great deal from his production last week. They did. And to have it go away ag- – Again, and this has happened a couple of different times now, that you need to see a guy like that step up, especially when you don't have Calvin Ridley in, in the pattern that you need more of these guys. This by committee approach, you yeah. need that committee to, to ultimately step up. That's not really what we saw here, and I think that they've got to be better moving forward against every type of coverage, really, as the Falcons try to get back in sync. And that's what we're going to talk about in this next quarter uh, as we kind of move on here. Thursday night's coming quick. Uh, again, and the Patriots are rolling. How can the Falcons get back on the right track? How can they rebound quickly uh, as we continue this season? <laughs> Quarter number four is going to talk about less about what happened against the Cowboys and more about how quickly they have to rebound because they have a Thursday night game against the New England Patriots who just had their way with the Cleveland Browns today. Mac Jones looking great. That defense is looking tough. And the Falcons normally – Thursday night football is like an unavoidable evil, right? You, nobody's ever mentally and physically ready to play four four days later, three days later, really, after you just play a football game. It's just not possible. But the Falcons seemed excited about the opportunity so they could flush this game as, as quickly as possible and try to get back on, like, on the winning track. Yeah. That's the optimist view of it, right? The other side of it is if they don't rebound well, they could be looking at 0-2 over the course of five days, going from 500 to two games under in a snap. So this is one of those times where they've got to find a way to rebound, right? And that's what we heard a lot during the press conferences. Find a way to rebound. Is that easier said than done? How can the Falcons really do that as they, uh, when they have a tough team coming into Mercedes-Benz Stadium pretty soon? Yeah, I think it – I can't remember. I think it was Grady Jarrett who said this post game who, who said, you know, we can't let this 
loss turn into a second loss. Right. And, and I think that was very well put because it easily could. I mean, when you're talking about as quick of a turnaround as a Thursday night game is, it absolutely could. And the the way that the Patriots are playing right now, I feel like this is one of the worst times to, to be playing this team because they do feel like they have – have their thing together and they have it together and I, I think they're playing very very well right now so this is a tough time to to play them but there's also the other side of that where it's like well Arthur Smith said it the reason why he didn't play some of those starters some of those guys in the fourth quarter of today's game against Dallas was because he knows that that Thursday night game is coming so it was like almost like okay like let's take this for what it was and let's go see if we can get another win or let's so let's see if we can go get a win on Thursday and guys will be fresher because of that they didn't have a huge battle like how they did against the Saints they they really didn't play in the fourth quarter so that maybe works in the Falcons' favor. I don't know if you're if you're looking at any way to kind of look at it because it's, it's always tough a Thursday night game. But that's kind of how I look at it. There are a lot of different variables I think that go into Thursday night games. Chris, how do you think that like like what's the magic potion here to get this team back on the right track pretty quickly? Yeah, I think I think they they I think they got it figured out with in terms of like flushing a loss and forgetting about it mm-hmm. um, and. Because considering how they back bounce back from each loss this season, and I just remember how uh, Matt Ryan approached the press conference after the Philly loss, and he was just, and even later that week, he was just like, you know, like, you know, people we lose games, it happens. So when you have a leader who understands, who's kind of mastered that ability of forgetting about a loss, I think that's great, so that they're not, you know, looming on that and thinking about that going into this game, but. Like Tori said, the Patriots are hitting their stride right now. I think they won four straight games. Um, they put up 45 today, and their starters were also pulled early. Oh, I didn't um, know that. See, that's the thing is when yeah. we're, we're watching the Falcons game and we're traveling, <laughs> we don't get to see the other games. Yeah, you know I have all the all the Patriots beat writers on my timeline. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they, they uh, the Patriots had the top two passers in today's game on their team. Like Brian Hoyer and Mac Jones had more passing yards than – Baker Mayfield and Case Keenum, who wow. who got hurt. So the defense is is playing well, firing you know, on all cylinders. Uh, Matthew Judon, I think, has nine sacks, and he's had seven is the highest in his career. So I think like one thing that that I think is important too is like the how things change in the NFL so quickly, especially yeah. this year. Like right. there's no yep. team who's dominating everyone. So even with the Patriots hitting the stride and everything, I. Today, I think I really learned that we got we have to approach each week as its own thing. Like yeah, <laughs> it's like its own it's entity. It really yeah, is. Really, this year, more than any other year, I saw a tweet the other day that said, uh, <laughs> "I don't think anyone's going to win the Super Bowl." Like, because everybody's <laughs> just beating each other. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. So, so I think it, it's fair to it's fair to just like we said, forget about this and and think that the the Falcons will, will come in here and look like a completely different team. If we're going to look at the NFL playoff picture in good times, we can look at it in less than ideal times as well. And as it looks right now, the uh, the Vikings won. Carolina with Cam Newton. Wow. Scores twice in two plays. Cam Cam Peter returns and, and he brings a win over the Cardinals. <laughs> what, over the Cardinals what in the, what in the world? That really goes back to your point. No one's going to win this. Rule. No one's winning. Uh, you know, the Saints lose to Tennessee, basically, if we're looking at seeding, because why not? The Falcons are ninth at this point, but it's all tight. It's yeah. all close. And Foyer said that last year they were they never felt like they were in the hunt. They never talked about it. Right. They're in the hunt now. And he said that's why we're so upset by how we played here, and I think that that motivation will spurn them forward. Is The goal is to be relevant, be in the mix in December. The only way that you can do that is by responding well through these difficult stretches. We, we've talked about softer portions of the schedule they ain't it. They ain't in that. Yeah, now. that's not where they are. They're in a much different place. So they gotta kind of stay competitive. As we see, some teams like the Vikings are pretty talented, right? Mm-hmm. That that we're starting to see some of these teams surge and all kind of fighting for for that six and seven spot. Falcons want to stay in it. I I think that motivation will be important. I think what Chris pointed out about Matt Ryan's leadership during these times. I think Arthur Smith is good at turning the, the page and nobody feels sorry for ourselves. There are no soft souls. I think all that comes into play. Can they can they get to a point against the Patriots at home where they can put themselves in position to to win this one late to go 
It's so funny. For as bad as everybody may feel after the Cowboys game, if you come out of this five day, two game stretch and you're one and one, you're like, all right. Yeah, here we you're go. you're totally good with that. Totally good with that. So we've been through the the start of this difficult stretch. No uh, Falcons fans are not thrilled. There's still an opportunity here to come out of it ahead or come out of it even and stay in the hunt. And I think that that's going to be important um, as we wrap up quarter number four and the end of this Falcons Final Whistle podcast. So with that, you all know the drill at this point, right? Go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube even. Give us a five-star rating, please. Please, pretty please, with sugar on top. That would be awesome. And uh, definitely listen and download each and every week. We're going to take you through the entire Falcon season. And after you're done with that, do us a solid. Stay tuned to the Falcons Podcast Network because Falcons Audible comes up on Wednesdays with DJ Rackley, DJ Shockley, and and Dave Archer. Lots of good insight. We're going to review this game and push it forward, and then those guys are going to take the torch from us and keep it moving forward and get you ready for Thursday night's game. That's how you can always stay in the know. That's how you can be smarter than your buddies at the bar. Listen to these (laughs) pods, man, and uh, definitely subscribe. Thank you so much for the time. We will talk to you again on Thursday. Well, it'll be Friday morning by that point. Friday morning, no doubt about that. (laughs)